Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session, Humanizing Pre-Course Contact with Google Sites. I'm Michelle Pekansky brock and I'm faculty mentor with CVC OEI and at one, and I'm also a part-time instructor at Mount San Jacinto College. And I'm joined here by Fabiola Torres. Fabio, you wanna say, go ahead and say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Fabiola Torres, instructor of Ethnic Studies at Glendale Community College. Also a co-facilitator for At One for the Equity Culturally Responsive Teaching and Learning and Humanizing Online Education. And I'm wearing this shirt because usually I wear very fancy stuff. Today is my 10 year anniversary of graduating from Pepperdine with the Masters in Learning Technologies. Yay! So, this is why I'm wearing it. <laughs> That's very special. Thank you for sharing. You've already told me to kick things <laughs> off. That's wonderful. Yay. Okay. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. And Fabi and I have been working together for a number of years as colleagues in this humanizing space. And um, we feel very strongly about how important it is to ensure that our students' online learning experiences are humanized. And so we're going to unpack a little bit about what that means and provide a specific strategy today about how to get started with humanizing an online learning experience. And um, I am going to go ahead and put a link in the chat right now um, with an arrow in front of it. And Stacy, if you could help me mute folks, um, if you notice anyone who is unmuted, um, that would be super helpful. So folks, if you could look in your chat right now, you're going to see a link to a website. And I'm going to show you that website just to be sure that you know where it should take you. If you click on that link, it's going to take you to this um, link here. And hold on, I apologize. Our captioner has just joined us, and I need to give that person captioning rights. Um, OK, Diana, you should be set now. Yes? I'm going to assume yes. Okay, well, if not, let me know. Um, the, the link that I just put in the chat will take you to this site. And this is actually a Google site that Fabi and I put together just for you. So this is a resource site for you. Uh, it has three pages. It has a home page, which we're looking at right now. And then in the upper right corner, you'll see that there is a navigation to two additional pages. I'm gonna click on the slides and you'll see that that takes you to a page on the Google site with our slides, so you have access to them. If you prefer to click through them while you're on today's call, you can do that, um, but they're there for you later. And then our goodies tab has lots of helpful resources for you to dig into later. And I want to point out um, right here is text that says webinar archive coming soon. So once we have the archive of this session done, it will be available for you right there. So if you save the link to this site, you should have everything that you need to continue um, your learning about hu uh, humanizing pre-course contact with Google Sites. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here. Our goals for today are to identify the value that pre-course contact provides for online students, particularly how it begins to create this ethos of care uh, that was referenced in the earlier webinar today, for those of you who attended it, um, hosted by Drs. Um, Lowe, Wood, and Harris. Um, we're also going to clarify why this topic here that we're talking about today is an equitable online teaching practice. We really want to be clear about connecting the dots between the practice that we're showcasing and why it is an equitable practice. We're also going to examine the benefits that using a public website for essential course resources provides to you. So what are the benefits that that opens up for you as an instructor? Oftentimes that's something that we don't think about as faculty. Um, and we may shy away from the idea of having a public website with our course information or resources or, or information about us on it. But let's unpack that. 
And finally, we're going to evaluate two examples of humanized pre-course contact strategies using Google Sites. And one of those examples will be a liquid syllabus from Bobby's course, and another one is going to be a welcome package from my online course. But to get us started, we want to start in the right place. And we think the right place is listening to students. So we have a video that we're going to play right now. It's only a two minute video. This is a video of online students um, from one of my past online courses. And I asked them a question. And the question was, if you sense that your online instructor cares about your learning, how does it affect you? And what we want you to do is listen very carefully, first of all. And as something resonates with you, when you hear something that resonates with you, we want you to share what that is in the chat, okay? So be sure that you have the chat open so that you can share your thoughts, things that kind of stand out, stand out to you, as also, and also see what um, your peers are contributing as well. So let's go ahead and get started. I asked my online community college students this question. If you sense that your online instructor cares about your learning, how does it affect you? Here's what a few of them had to say. When I sense that an online instructor cares about my learning, um, it kind of affects me, I guess. It, it makes me want to engage in learning even more. You know, just knowing that that help and support is behind you and you're being pushed, you know, even further. That's kind of how it affects me. If you're able to sense that your instructor cares about your learning, it impacts you um, across many levels that you'll be able to do better in your course. You'll be able to be more open with your teacher and ask more questions and you'll know that she'll give you more feedback if you need more help. This makes it so you get the best out of your education. In response to the first question, I do believe that when an instructor um, portrays that they really care about the material and the class, it really does have a tremendous effect for me personally as far as engagement goes. It makes me want to interact a lot more. Um, I'll be honest, it makes me remember <laughs> assignments um, a lot more. Um, and also too, just like when you can tell when a professor is uh, just doing like base, like uh, out of textbook questions or whatever but it's really cool to see like professors come up with their own creative um assignments and things like that so that's also uh, makes it just more enjoyable overall and makes it feel like an experience compared to just a class that you have to take if you sense that your online instructor cares about your learning how does it affect you it affects me positively because it makes me feel like I can ask questions and I can connect with the professor and engage more in the class and it keeps me from feeling as if I'm going to be shut down. Okay, we learned so much when we listen to our students. I'm going to just loop back and, and uh, cite a couple of things that I see here in the chat. Opens up communication, um, creates trust, establishes a willingness for students to ask for help. Uh, students feel more confident about asking questions and requesting feedback. Um, get the best out of your education, build a relationship, care about the material. There is that idea of remembering. It helps students remember assignments more. I think that's what a student said. Um, and creative assignments, right? Teacher made assessments, I think someone said. It feels like an experience, not just something that you have to do. So I think um, fundamentally, oh, and, and Bobby, what's your favorite, what's your favorite line from that that you want to point out? It does that the teacher's not going to shoot, not going to make her feel that she's going to be shot down. Absolutely. How many students come into our course, particularly our students from minoritized backgrounds that come into a course that are probably used to being shut down, right, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. academic environments. And so that expectation is set. So it's up, for, uh, it's up to us as the, the faculty member to shift that around and to establish 
what was referred to e earlier in the uh, earlier webinar that I referenced as an ethos of care. Bobby, is there anything else you want to add to that before I move on? No, nope, that was good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so it is also interesting to know that there is research um, that mm -hmm. shows that an online instructor caring is a really big deal, particularly in community college online courses. And when we look to the research, I have to really stress how important it is to look at who is in the sample. Because oftentimes we look at research thinking, oh, I want to use that to guide my teaching. And the sample could be a group of graduate students. And that's a very different group of students that, that students that have very different needs than students we serve in uh, community colleges or open access institutions. So this particular study here from 2016 uh, was conducted specifically on online community college students. And it showed that the only course design element of an asynchronous online course that significantly and positively influenced grades is quality interpersonal interactions, not quantity, not the number of interactions between an instructor and a student, but the quality of those interactions. And if you're wondering what that means, how does quality get defined? The way that it's defined based on the qualitative data in the study was that students noted it was all about having a sense that their instructor cared about them. And I should also note that more students in that study did not experience quality instructor to student interactions. So this is an opportunity that we can really build upon. And more students also reported the need to teach themselves than when being in a face-to-face -face course. So why does, why does caring matter? You know, what's, how does this work? Well, it's really, it really comes down to the process of learning. We are human beings. And when we approach learning, particularly in higher education, when we approach teaching and learning, oftentimes we just think about one part of learning. We think about cognition, the domain of understanding and the construction of knowledge. But you can never separate cognition from affection from the emotional part. The way you feel always informs your ability to learn. It informs how you respond to any situation. And this is something that all of us are very aware of. And it's something that our, our minoritized students are particularly aware of because that kind of marginal, the, 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 the effect of being marginalized really does kind of create that, that toxic stress in their own lives um, and they bring that that comes into our, their experiences in the classroom and that's something that we definitely want to unhinge and create a learning environment that is based in trust we also know that um, self-doubt about one's academic abilities is prevalent among community college students and open access in uh, students and open access institutions we accept 100 percent the top 100% of students, as our chancellor likes to say. Um, and we know that minoritized students are often left out of social narratives of academic achievement. The research about online learning in general shows that when learning at a distance from one's instructor and peers, anxieties can get worse. That sense of isolation can exacerbate these anxieties. Um, and so that's something to be to be aware, of, particularly in this um, this traumatic uh, period that we're we are in, and we don't know how long this is going to last for. But this looking forward, this this unknown in ahead of us um, is is incredibly stressful. We also know that our students are they they've told us we we have data now that shows that students are um, more anxious, more depressed. They're grappling with financial challenges. Many of them are stepping into bigger family responsibility roles. I had a student in my own online class who shared with me that he went from working 20 hours a week to over 50 hours a week because both of his parents had been furloughed and now he's the one who's paying the rent for his family. These are all things that affect learning. Um, so that effective piece of learning is, is really what is critical to support and it's, it has to be more intentional online. And that's what humanized online teaching does. It, the the uh, humanized online teaching is really comprised of different practices that support the cognitive and the effective needs of learners so that all of our students can achieve their full intellectual capacity. It's not about making things easier. It's not about reducing rigor. 
It's about supporting the effective or the non-cognitive components of learning to ensure that all of our students have the opportunity to achieve their full intellectual capacity. Now, when we think about teaching through the lens of a, of a faculty member, uh, we often start thinking about our class starting on day one, right? Week one is when my online class starts. Well, it's really amazing when you take a step back and look at this experience through the lens of a student because students register, right? Well, register well before week one starts, as we know. And it's that point between registration and week one that we actually lose a lot of our students. A lot of students don't even show up in the course. And so the practice that we have here today that we're gonna show you is a, is a practice that fits into this high, opportunities, high opportunity zone, this kind of between registration and week one um, to help welcome and encourage more students to step into your course because learning is a cognitive and effective process. So we wanna, again, support that effective element. And why is this about equity? Um, first of all, it's important to stress that equity is not the same as equality. Uh, if you look back over the several decades, we're, we're coming out of a, a paradigm of equality and we're moving into a paradigm of equity. And what this means is in equality means that we treat all of our students the same. And the problem with treating all of our students the same is that it implies that all of our students are the same and they are not the same. We have students that are very diverse. And so equity recognizes that students are different and values diversity and an equitable learning environment seeks to remove barriers to ensure that all students have what they need to be successful. So if you think back to what we just talked about, about humanizing, um, that if there's, a, if there's a flare up with the effective domain, right, then that is a barrier. And if we can support that, then it's removing that barrier and helping more students to be successful. And when teaching online, we need to be more intrusive because we are not there in front of our students. They are not there in front of us. We have to intentionally construct our presence, reach out to them, intentionally seek to understand what's happening on their side of the screen and understand them as real people with stories. And from there, I'm gonna pass it on over to Fabi. Can you unmute Fabi? Okay, great. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Hi everyone. Yes, I'm Fabiola Torres from Glendale Community College. Um, so I want to hear, I want to share this slide with you, the dimensions of equity. Um, these are different approaches to education and just to learning. Um, we have multicultural education, social justice education, and culturally responsive pedagogy. Now I'd like to focus on the culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, one of the things I wanna reiterate about an equity-minded learning environment is that there are three elements that make it complete. There is the institutional response, the professional response, and the personal response. And culturally responsive teaching and learning is a research-based research -based approach that makes meaningful connections between what students learn in school and their culture, language, and life experiences. So it's that connection that Michelle was talking about in which we have cognition plus affection. Um, when a student has a direct connection to the course content, they feel that they have intellectual capacities and it creates competency and competency then leads to confidence. So when we look at culturally responsive teaching and learning, it's definitely about caring. It's caring through our professional lens. Let me repeat that again. It's caring through our professional lens. So how we view our course, our students, you know, it really is about caring and culturally responsive teaching and learning is definitely a great strategy. 
On the bottom, you'll see that it says adapted from the work of Zaretta Hammond. Highly recommend that author. She is amazing. And she has inspired me and others to really look at the strategies of culturally responsive teaching and learning. And of course, the most important element that, that is featured in culturally responsive teaching and learning is caring. Caring, yes, caring. So somebody just put in the, in the chat, culturally responsive teaching and the brain. Yes, that is a, that's a transformative book. Um, so let me just really quickly go through some of the attributes of caring. Uh, there are four attributes. Caring is attending to a person's, to a person's performance. It's caring. Caring is action. You know, it's, it's, it's action provoking. Uh, the third one is caring prompts effort and achievement. And number four, caring is multidimensional and responsive, meaning that caring is a process. It's not about just making this liquid syllabus or having the pre-course contact. You know, that's important, but it's also carrying that all the way through to the very, very end. So culturally responsive pedagogy is an extremely helpful strategy that focuses on caring. So let's go to the next slide. So how do we do this? Okay, how do we get started in uh, with an on, you know, in our online classes? Next slide. So before I introduce the liquid syllabus, I want to talk about the pancake, the first pancake, which has now become an inside joke for many of us, but it's powerful. So when we make a liquid syllabus or when we start to see a liquid syllabus, I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed or intimidated and feel like, ooh, I can't do this. And then we push it away. That is a feeling that all learners go through. I mean, we think about it, even from, ch from childhood, if there's something we can't do, we push it away. And so Zaretta Hammond has this great metaphor of the first pancake. You know, when we're going to make pancakes, it's exciting. We're going to have pancakes. Yum. But when we make our first pancake, it doesn't come out perfect. You know, it's gooey on one side, it's burnt on the other. But we know that if we keep going and we make our own feedback loop, add more water, add more batter, change the temperature, we'll be able to make a better pancake. So what she's saying is that, we are in this culture. Academia creates this culture of perfection. Like we have to be perfect right away. And so she wants to invoke the first pancake. So when we feel like there is this conscious incompetence, we need to invoke the first pancake. This is just the first pancake. So when we move forward and share with you the liquid syllabus, please note that when you decide to jump in, that it's your first pancake and that good stuff is coming. The good stuff is coming. And then, you know, by the fifth pancake, yum, you know, it's perfect and it's amazing. And, and you know, we, we get better at it. So I wanna, as I move forward with, um, you know, when we get to showing you what a liquid syllabus looks like, just take a breath and say, okay, I can do this because, What's more important here is authentic care. Authentic care, that's what needs to shine through is the authentic care. And that goes beyond you know, all the technical bells and whistles. We have to just show that we care. Okay, next slide. So let's look at a video that explains the benefits of a liquid syllabus. And of course, this was designed and presented by Michelle pakansky Brock. I know what you're thinking. I have a syllabus. And I've worked really hard on it. So why should I take the time to also create a liquid syllabus? And what does that mean anyway? After all, I already have my syllabus online in the form of a PDF. And I know all my students can access it in Canvas. But folks, the thing is, when your syllabus is behind a login screen, it may be tough for students to get to it from their phone. And no matter how lovely it looks on a computer, 
Reading it on a mobile device is tough. The information in that syllabus is important, right? The bottom line is when we use tools designed for print products, they don't result in mobile friendly experiences. And that's not good for our students. How might things change if you used a website tool like Google Sites or WordPress to create a liquid version of your syllabus? For just a moment, imagine being a student. It's the start of your first semester in college and the week before class starts. You check your email and you get a friendly welcome message from your sociology instructor. It includes a button at the bottom to check the syllabus. You tap that button with your finger and instantly you go to a syllabus that's easy to read and experience with the swipe of your finger. And you also discover something pretty special at the top. Hi scholars, my name is Katie Whitman Conklin and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. A little bit about me, I lived in the Central Valley of California for a lot of years with my husband and children while he was stationed there with the Navy. And when he retired, we moved to Northern Idaho where we now live with our kids on a family ranch. You think to yourself, hey, I'm gonna love this class. I can't wait to get started. But you know what? That's not the only benefit of a liquid syllabus. Since it lives on the web, it's shareable with a simple link. That means you can place that link in as many other places as you'd like. How about adding it next to your course description in your college's class schedule? Or on your profile page on your college website? Or a link on your own professional website? And you know what can really help promote your course and encourage more students to enroll? That's right, share it on Twitter. When we design with web tools, we create mobile friendly content that supports our students in so many ways. It also lets them know we care. Yes, we care. So the question was brought up in the, uh, in the chat, so thank you. Because someone's saying, well, what's the difference between, you know, why don't we just use uh, the, the Canvas tool? Well, first of all, the reason why it's also called a liquid syllabus is because it doesn't live behind a wall, meaning a student doesn't have to wait to be in the class to know what the class is about. So that's another, why, another way to see why liquid, its liquid nature enables you to, enables a student to see it before coming into the class. It's a free website creation tool from Google. It's a public website. So this is where you can place it in your, you know, course description, in your directory. If you Google me and I come up at Glendale, my website, my Google site comes up. So students will go there and look for it. You can use it for your professional website, your LinkedIn, part-timers. If you're creating a teaching portfolio, this is a great way to demonstrate what you know, how you're approaching your class. So there's a lot of benefits even just on the professional end. Um, to create a Google site, you must have a Google account. Now, Michelle and I both recommend using your own personal Google account and using it specifically just for your creative and um, your creative work for your course. Um, it does require just basic web flu fluency skills. Very simple. I will say that I don't have any HTML <laughs> background, um, but this is very template based. Just, you know, we did present this back in on Tuesday and four faculty that never use Google Sites started building their liquid syllabus and already shared it. So they weren't afraid of the first pancake. Uh, so that's why it's exciting. Um, and then of course, videos can easily be imbe embedded um, through your YouTube page. And of course, below we have here, and it's also in, in part of the, the, the goodies, right, Michelle? The how to create the Google account? Uh, yes, I can show them how to, it's, it's kind of buried to get to, but it is in there. Yes, okay. that's Good. why I put it here too. <laughs> yeah. So this will, it, it's again, it's, it's, there's templates already available and all you have to do is just cut and paste from your syllabus 
And then of course, decide what is it that you want to be public? What is your, uh, another metaphor I came up with, what is your movie trailer of your movie of your class? So um, this is how Google Sites works for you, even on a professional level, as well as for your students. And you know, last but not least, somebody, one of, remember the, the video that, I'm sorry, the, the voice thread that Michelle presented. One of the elements that shows that a teacher cares is that they're creative. And I, I believe that creating a liquid syllabus goes beyond, you know, compliance, goes beyond what's expected of us that a student could actually share your Google site on their Facebook and say, look, my teacher, you know, how cool is this? And you're also promoting your course. So this is why it's valuable to have that public, you know, um, access to your, your course. Okay, next slide. So I have here just to another, <laughs> I love metaphors. Um, my mom would always tell us before we jump into cold water, we needed to wet our ears and the back of our neck to avoid the gasp. So we're, let's wet our ears and the back of our neck to avoid a gasp. Please, this is my fifth pancake. So as you go through this, as I share this liquid syllabus with you, please don't be intimidated. Um, this is my fifth pancake. So. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So, um, okay. So now it's my turn to share my screen. Okay. So here is my landing page. I have a landing page because I have three syllabi that are connected to my landing page. So here is, and of course I've updated so that it is it demonstrates that i'm relevant and it shows that i'm up to date with you know what's going on um, our campus has come up with new grading options that you should check with your campus to see if there are any new grading option resources for your students to know um, so here i'm going to show you a video i have two here one is my teaching philosophy and one is my eight week online course i'm going to go ahead and show you this one as an example. Hello everyone, and welcome to our eight week online ethnic studies course. Now, let me explain the format to the class. This course takes 16 weeks and compresses it into eight weeks. That means one week of our class is equal to two weeks of a regularly scheduled class. It moves very fast and some of us might even feel overwhelmed. However, it's my job to help you navigate through each week. Each week. So that's an example of just me again, letting them know that. Oh, by the way, if you see poop here, that's because I once sent a message to my students that Canvas wasn't playing nice and I made myself into poop. <laughs> it's just, it's weird. Um, Bobby does anything for her students. <laughs> So here's my landing page. I don't take myself too seriously. I made a little video on ethnic studies because I want to promote my department. It's not just me. I have part-timers and other full-time faculty teaching in ethnic studies. And so I want them to know that ethnic studies creates, you know, be, makes us become a better you or a better us, you know, we, we become better. I have videos here of getting to know me, my parents, and again, I'm humanizing. I'm, I'm removing that, that curtain that many of us hide behind uh, because our academic uh, uh, experience made us, you know, become so self-conscious of ourselves. And again, everyone, this is my fifth pancake. <laughs> so here is my ethnic studies. So once again, I have here my welcome to my ethnic studies and my eight week I have the course description that's in the catalog and of course the student learning outcomes. What's really important is I believe it's important to have the course outline of record, the course outline of record um, public so that a student can click on it and print out the course outline of record just in case they need to take it to their four-year institution for um, articulation uh, questions. And so here you have my classes divided into four. Why take this class? Is it hard? What is expected of me? And any help. And so when you click on, for example, is this, you know, is it hard? 
I have here, you know, how much reading, how much weekly work, how many tests, you know, all the questions that students, you know, uh, care about. Um, and I'm being, you know, I'm being transparent uh, about it. And of course, once again, I'm making sure that the grading options are available for our students. Please check with your counseling department regarding grading options. Um, and so, as you can see here, any extra credit, et cetera, et cetera. I have a video on discussions, formative assessments, and summative assessments. If they want to see a big picture of the class, kind of like a bird's eye view, they can see, you know, what is a rough outline. In Canvas, I'll have a more detailed outline, but at least here they'll see the, the type of work that is going to be, you know, the rhythm of the class, as I like to say. It gives them a sense of predictability, which is another culturally responsive teaching and learning strategy. When students are aware of what is expected, they'll be able to know, you know, how to make their decisions uh, in relation to taking the course. Um, again, here is I, I kind of give them a narrative as to why ethnic studies. You know, our discipline is in many ways under attack. And so I feel the need as an ethnic studies instructor to be able to be transparent of how this class is going to be taught and what are the values of this course. I have here unit descriptions and then videos that set the tone to the course. So they'll be able to see these are the videos that, you know, again, it's the trailer of the class. By the way, these are really good. <laughs> Now, one thing I wanted to share is the responsiveness of Google, um, Google um, Sites. This is how it looks on their phone. Okay, so in Google Sites, you can click to see when, you can see, you can click to, to see how it looks on their phone. Okay, so they click up here and this is their syllabi. They click on it. This is my Ethnic Studies 121, and it's the ethnic minorities in the U.S. And so this is how accessible it is in relation to their phone. Okay. So, Michelle, can we go back to the presentation? Oh, I need to stop sharing. You got it. So in short, a liquid syllabus, it shapes a student's first impression. That's important, it's a first impression. It conveys a student-centered tone, it displays your commitment, and it welcomes students. And you know, I like to say, when we go to a restaurant, or when we used to go to restaurants, you know, many of us would check on a Yelp review to see if we wanted to go to that restaurant or if that restaurant's even worth it. So we go, to, we go to Yelp. Now, where do students go to check if we're going to be easy or not, good or not? They go to Rate My Professor. And that suddenly defines us. And as many of us would agree, it doesn't really define who we are. So why not take charge of your narrative and create that public image of yourself? So when a student Googles you and you put your name on the actual web page. Mine is Ethnic Studies by Fabiola Torres. If you go to Google and you click and you search Fabiola Torres, not only will I come out at Glendale, but I will also come out as a Google site. So suddenly I'm taking control of how I am being, how I'm defining myself. So Guy Kawasaki, I, he's a great marketing uh, genius. He always says, if you don't define yourself, someone else will. So Let's take charge of how we define ourselves. Next slide. Here's a quote about uh, social and historical discrimination of Black and Latino students and how they benefit from full disclosure of the terms of success. And so this is basically sh demonstrating in the research that the, the Institute, the Center of Urban, and Edu Urban Education, which was 
part of the presenters in the webinar that Michelle and I attended earlier. It is very important for students to know what the terms of success are. Are we demonstrating that we care for them? Are we making intentional choices to demonstrate that we care? And can we capture this even before the session begins? Next slide. So we're back to this slide. What could humanized pre-course contact look like? So what I added to this slide was a pre-course contact countdown, okay? And you could look at the sample videos on your time, um, but I wanna show here that, you know, five to seven days, you wanna introduce yourself and your liquid syllabus. Just say, hey, it's not official yet, but I just wanted to get to know, you know I just want you guys to get to know me, okay? Now, the reason why I have five to seven days is because all institutions have their own policies and procedures in when faculty have the ability to publish their Canvas site. On our campus, it's five days. But I want to get in touch with my students before five days. So I introduce them to my liquid syllabus and I use my, you know, roster that I get through PeopleSoft and I email them and I let them know you don't have access to Canvas yet, but here is your liquid syllabus. By the time my, my campus opens up Canvas and I have access to them via Canvas, then you can send the welcome letter and open up your orientation module. And then of course, one to three days, you wanna monitor student engagement. Make sure you check with your campus to know about your student authentication procedures because many of us have to drop students at a certain time because of wait list situations. But again, enable, um, I'm sorry, make sure that you check with your, with your institution regarding uh, such policies, such procedures. And then of course, I'm repeating it again, check with your counseling regarding new grading guidelines. Next. Okay, Michelle, this is on you. Okay, um, I do have a practice that I'm gonna share um, in just a moment. We did have a few questions. Uh, there was one about accessibility that came up that I did answer in the chat, but I wanted to verbalize just to be sure that it is included in the archive. On an earlier slide, when the slide that was titled, what is Google Sites? At the bottom of that slide, we had three steps to get started with Google Sites. And the third step takes you out to a resource that walks you through some important practices to ensure that the content on your site is accessible. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just something that I did want to address. Fabi and I are, it, are very careful about ensuring that um, videos on the site do have captions, that header text is used, that images do have alt text um, if they are functional. So I uh, just wanted to add, add that note there. So my welcome, and Fabi, please feel free to answer some more questions in the chat. Um, as I continue to speak because we are getting a little tight on time. Um, so my practice is simply an adaptation of the liquid syllabus. Um, it's, I call it a welcome package. So when I share it with my students before the course starts in an email, I refer to it that way. Um, I say here, check out the welcome package. It has everything that you need to be successful in week one of our course. And my intent is for them to review it and by the way, it's a single page, whereas um, the site that Fabi showed had multiple pages on her site. So mine is a single page that is just scrollable um, that I hope makes it friendly for being on a mobile device. That's my intent. And the way that I, I convey to my students that I care about their learning and that I trust them is through a couple of different things that you'll see featured in the welcome package. One is my teaching philosophy that I'll point out. And the other one is the learning pact that models learning as a partnership between me and my students. Um, so I am in it with them, and that's a way that I break down that hierarchy. And that learning pact is also a practice that comes from culturally, te culturally responsive teaching, um, one that Zaretta Hammond really highlights. And it also includes week one schedule and due dates. So, uh, whoops, that's not what I wanna show you. show you. This is it right here. And I'm going to also, let me see if I have it saved to my clipboard the way, yeah. There's the link to it so you can open it on your own screen. Um, so 
I teach the history of still photography at Mount San Jacinto College. Uh, at the top of this welcome package, it has a, a, a friendly welcome and a three minute video from me uh, that you're welcome to watch on your own. I use a tool called Adobe Spark Video for my, for my video. And sometimes it's a good place to get started with video because it doesn't require you to actually show your face. So it's actually your voice narration over images. Um, and so you could have photographs of yourself and, and provide voice narration over that. If you do use Adobe Spark, it, you do need to download the video from Spark and then upload it into YouTube and ensure that it's captioned there and then embed it in your Google site. So it's a little bit of a different workflow. Um, Spark videos can't be embedded in Google sites and they also cannot be captioned. So you've got to keep that accessibility, accessible workflow in mind. It also points out that uh, the course is eight weeks long. It's a fully online course. Of course, I'd plug in the, the date here. I don't have my date for fall yet, so I don't have it plugged in. Uh, it, it points out that they'll be learning in a community with their peers. It's not a self-paced course. We have some students coming out of high school that that's their perception, that if you take a class online, it's something that's self-paced. So I want to start breaking those perceptions and really informing them about what this class is going to be like. The class does not meet regularly in Zoom. We're, we have a lot of students who now think that online classes are all in Zoom. This is an asynchronous course. It's designed with effective practices for online teaching and learning in mind. It's asynchronous. It removes that synchronous barrier for students um, and some, some other information there. So this is the pact that I was talking about. It has a list of seven things that they can expect from me, and I'll let you read through them on your own. And then it has a list of seven things that I will expect from my students. And you'll notice that there's an eight, eighth item on there, and I ask them, is there anything else that you'd like to add to either of these lists? And they have an opportunity to add something in the course when we get started. Um, and they also agree to the pact once we are in the course. So again, setting up learning as a two-way street, something that I am in, I'm in it with them. I want them to know that. Um, course goals, okay, that's, that's boring old stuff. <laughs> the teaching philosophy, um, I'm just going to read this to really have you just have an opportunity to reflect on the role that um, diversity plays in my teaching philosophy. I believe learning should be meaningful and that the differences of each person brings the differences each person brings into a course enrich the learning of the group. Each of us learns at a unique rhythm, which is precisely why I love online classes. Unlike a live classroom, asynchronous or delayed online environments like ours provide you with the luxury of thinking and reflecting before you engage. They create a seat at the table for everyone. They also enable us to see the world as our classroom. I design my courses to showcase and celebrate the diversity of members of our learning community and to encourage each of you to connect our course content to your own life. Um, and moving downward, the week one success kit provides uh, an overview of, of how the, the modules roll out. Now, this um, graphic here is actually from last spring, and uh, the course I was teaching was a late start course, and week two of the course was actually spring break, which was super awkward. Uh, but that's why I have that in this graphic here, because I want students to see, right? Week one starts on a Monday. So you see it says, um, Week one starts on a Monday. They see when their assignments are due that first week. And then I also included um, that the, there's an assignment due on Wednesday. And I explained that I actually am giving them extra time to get that done since there is no new module done during spring break. And that would, of course, be updated for fall. And then I have materials that they need for week one. They're, um, I point out that I want them to download the Canvas student app. I want them to use it for our course. It's a resource, resource for them. And I also want them to download the VoiceThread mobile app because VoiceThread is a tool that we use in our course and students can use it on their phone or they can use it on their computer with a microphone. They have a choice between one or the other. And some students use both, but I want them to be prepared with that so they don't have to worry about that when the class starts. It's one less thing to have to do. And then supplies that they're going to need to actually create a camera obscura. 
which is what they do in week one. Um, and so there's a couple of different options and a list of, of goodies that they need to have that are um, pretty easy to access. Um, didn't have anyone have a problem doing this in the spring, which was great. And then of course the due dates for week one, and these would be plugged in when the new term starts. I have four tips for success. Be proactive, plan for the unexpected, communicate with me, and use the to-do list and calendar in Canvas that are super helpful. I want to be sure students know about those things. So um, by the time they get done with this, they, have, they should feel very confident. My hope for them is that every student can look at this course and see that they can succeed in it. It is set up for everyone to succeed. They are going to work hard. They're going to have a lot of work to do. They're going to have a lot of assignments, but I'm in it with them and I believe in them and I know they can do it. Um, so notes about grades. Again, you can re read through this on your own, but I'm acknowledging the stress of COVID-19 that I'm here to be flexible and support them. And then down at the bottom, we've got student support resources, important dates, which again would be updated. And then there's a link here to log into the course, which takes them to the campus's uh, Canvas login screen. Mm -hmm. So that is the welcome package. Um, and I think that was actually our last slide. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop sharing our screen, my screen and go to um, our chat. What questions do we have to answer here? So, um, well, there was one question uh, for you regarding a uh, uh, pact and social pact. Um, it was from Joyce. It was just for her own clarity. Is there a difference between the pact and the older concept of social contract? Um, the older concept of social contract, Joyce, you would have to you would have to explain that to me because I'm not sure exactly what that is. So I do not want to actually explain say if it's the same or not um so i'm sorry i can't answer that <laughs> <laughs> so um I'll, actually it was really everybody must have been really intense and in listening lots of great um you know uh you know people are really excited the good ideas happy that they're here thank you everyone for the nice and for the compliments um yes these these are google slides we we used google slides and google pages for this because Michelle and I are collaborating after all. Um, and yes, we need to share the Google site uh, webinar again. Um, now, one thing that um, I guess, Michelle, just to make sure that we, everyone knows how they can get the presentation um, after today. Yeah, let me point that out again. Um, I, I did say this as we got started. I know, I know we often have people who come in a few minutes late. Um, but just to be sure, so you have the link to our Google site, or I, let me let me not call it a Google site, to our resource site, which I'm showing now on the screen. That's the link that I just put in the, the chat. So if you haven't clicked that link yet with the arrow in front of it, click it now because it'll open on your own computer then, okay? And keep that URL um, because if you go over to the goodies page here, you're going to see that there's text here that says webinar archive coming soon and as soon as it's available i will add that link there um, but it's also available from the at one youtube channel that you can get to this might be too much information but if you did find out about this webinar from the cvc.edu events page you go to cvc.edu events and click on view calendar of events and this is how you get to the um, CVC OEI at one YouTube channel. This is our webinar playlist. So that it'll, it'll be plugged in there and then it will also be linked over on our site. So if either, if either option is more intuitive to you, both, both options will get you to the archive. And also just to do a, a plug for at one, we oh, do yes. have a course on humanizing online teaching and learning and a course on equity and culturally responsive teaching and learning. And um, the final product for the equity course is a syllabus and a liquid syllabus is the option. So we have links to both of those courses under keep learning on our goodies page. 
And I want, since we have a couple minutes, let me point out one more resource. This top link under Keep Learning, the Pocket PD Guide to Humanizing, I'm going to click there. And um, this guide, this is actually Google Slides that are embedded in a web page. You can make your own copy of these slides, or you can simply just click through them right here. And this is going to take you into a little bit of a deeper dive into humanizing, and you'll be able to pick up some more strategies for humanizing. So some of this stuff is going to look familiar because there's overlap with what we shared here today. There's that video again. <laughs> um, but we have three practices for humanizing included here that we haven't covered today. So cultivating your human presence. It talks a little bit about developing videos for your online course how to identify your high opportunity students by conducting a getting to know you survey in week one, and how to become a warm demander. What is warm demander pedagogy? Uh, so if you click through these slides, you'll get lots of great resources, see more examples, have videos to watch, there's Fabi, um, and you'll certainly be able to keep your learning going. Where would you find the links to our Google Sites? Um, the links to the Google Sites that we just shared are on the goodies page of our resource site right here, Bobby's liquid syllabus and Michelle's welcome package. Okay, so again, yeah, thank you, Stacy. <laughs> so click on the link that Stacy Carrasco just put in the chat and then select the goodies button at the top right of your window and you'll find it. Okay. Okay, well, thanks so much, everybody. Yes. It looks Thank like, you so looks like things much. are winding down. I know it's, it's late in the afternoon. Everyone take care. Take care of yourselves. Just take care of yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for taking time. May I ask you a quick question?